I'm just gonna randomly film you. This man is ranty, and right now he's filming Blackpool from Southport, a distance of about 15 miles away. It was footage like this that once convinced him that the earth was flat, so much so that he created his own YouTube persona called Ranty Flat Earth. And on his YouTube channel, he presented regular content, which he claimed was evidence for the earth being flat. I'm a science teacher who goes by the name of Conspiracy Cats on YouTube, and I think that misinformation that can force people to jump down conspiracy rabbit holes can be a very, very destructive force in people's lives. So as a result of all of that, I went head to head for a long time against Ranty on YouTube, poking fun at his ideas, and sometimes teasing the man himself a little. These are the adventures of Ranty, the Flat Earther, as he explores the strange world known to Fraggles as The Globe. I'm a stupid flat earther, and I want to know where these mountains have gone. And Ranty often returned the favour, slapping me down with a series of response videos. But I do think it's fair to say that however at each other's throats we were, throughout that period we never really crossed the line, and however much we irritated each other, that door for civil dialogue was always just wide enough open. But still, nobody was more surprised than I was when Ranty came to me with this photograph that had been taken from the same location by Kevin Johnson on Twitter. Ranty analysed the relative heights of Blackpool Tower and the mountains behind it and came to the inevitable conclusion that, of course, the Earth isn't flat and he'd been wrong all along. So I went to Southport to meet the man himself and talk to Ranty about his experiences in Flat Earth, about how he now views the community he left behind, and maybe even more importantly, how that community now view him. And at this point, I will point out that Ranty does have his own now uh, anti-Flat Earth channel, which I have linked in the description. So we're going to make a bit of a day of it today. We're going to go and play some pool, uh, have a, a couple of interviews. I've got some questions that um, people have asked me to ask you, and I've got some of my own. Yep. Um, I believe you've got some questions as well. But we're going to start because I have heard that you're quite a good pool player. I have been known to play a game of pool now and then, but uh, I haven't picked a queue up for about three years, and I've only played maybe 50 games in the past 15 years. But prior to that, I was pretty good. So I still think I've got it in me to be, uh, you know, reasonable. I wouldn't say I'll be anywhere near as good as I was, but I think I'll be able to give you a good run for your money because I've heard that you're actually a very good player too. So it's a similar story. I'm getting old, it's just like all of us now, mate. I don't get time to do this. I've not picked a queue up for a few years, but I have been known to knock a few balls in. So let's see if we've still got it in <laughs> and uh, who might come out on top. That'll be interesting. Bragging rights and all. Um, and then, yeah, we'll go and do our interviews and see how it goes. See, yeah, we'll see how the day goes. Right. right. Happy days. Right. Goodbye. Goodbye. So that's what we did, we played some pool, we had something to eat, we buried the hatchet, and then we got down to the serious stuff of the interview. But I wanna start with the pool. Now, if you have no interest in watching two grown men play pool in a, a little competition, then just fast forward the next six minutes, nobody's gonna be offended by that. But if you wanna see it, here it is. Welcome to the YouTube Pool Champion of Championship of Champions. First up, it's Ranty, AKA Flurfspective. With the highest break on the snooker table of 107, he'll be hoping that the three years he's not touched a queue won't stop him regaining his old form, which saw him become the filed pool champion, amongst many other honours. He'll be facing off against Baldy Cats, who looks like a little bit of a pool ball, so he should be right at home today. Cats will be trying to prove that size doesn't matter today, as his highest break on the snooker table is only 76. Like Ranty, it's been three years since he's picked up a queue, and he'll be hoping to regain the kind of form that once saw him win a little plastic trophy. Now both players are ready to go, so let's join the action in this first four frame battle. Oh, I can tell you've played. I can tell you've played. A nice compliment there from Ranty before he comes out of the blocks like a greyhound. Check this out. Not just a good pot, but excellent position. He needs another good positional shot here though, to get on that yellow that's on the cushion. And he's under hit that. But he knows the importance of getting it off the cushion and he puts it in a fantastic spot. Really good play. Now Cat's needing a snooker here. Can he find one? Can he roll the white up behind the black? I don't think he's got it. Oh dear. This could be embarrassing for Cat's. Right from the word go good pot here and it's all over. Ranty is on fire. Embarrassing for cats. Yeah. So. 
So a shell shot Katz now realises the quality of the opponent that he's up against. We join frame two after a long safety battle with Katz needing to pull off a world class positional shot to give himself a chance to level things. The thing is after a long safety battle is you've got to take your chances when they come. A good positional shot here and it should be a formality. And that is a great shot. World class if I say so. Surely only an imbecile could miss from here. It's got to be 1-1. One, one. Oh. But Ranty doesn't show mercy like Katz and he pulls it back to smash this black right in that top corner for 2-0. Now with Katz destroyed and the way he's been totally outplayed, everybody forgets that the frame isn't over until the white ball stops moving. So one apiece and Katz can count himself a very lucky man indeed. We join frame three with Ranty in a commanding position. All his reds are down and with the black over the pocket, Katz is in a tough spot. It's going to be tricky to get this one safe. There's a potential snooker behind that yellow by the middle pocket. It'll take a delicate shot and that's a good one. But not too good for Ranty who gets out of it with ease, leaving Katz having to play even more safety shots. Eventually the persistence pays off and Katz has a chance to clear up, which would devastate Ranty, who's been by far the better player. Really he should be 3-0 up at this point with where we were just a couple of moments ago. If he was to fall 2-1 down, that would be devastating. Another world-class positional shot on the black is needed here. Perhaps the greatest shot ever played. And there it is. Will Katz miss this time? He's a lucky, lucky boy if he gets this to go 2-1 up. He should be 3-0 down. To say Katz is riding his luck at the minute is a bit of an understatement. He is 2-1 in front, but I don't think even he would disagree that at this point he should be 3-0 down. But he is starting to feel his arm loosen up a little bit. Can he see this through and be the first to four? So it looks like Rance is playing a tactical shot here. He's going to force Katz to play the easy yellow over the pocket so it's not there for later on. Quite a clever tactical aim. Katz's problem is clearly the yellow on the cushion. And that is world class to get that yellow off the cushion. Oh my God. But can he clear up from here? He must concentrate. Beautiful sweatpants. Beautiful sweatpants. The yellow. He's not managed it. He'll be disappointed with that effort, but he has left himself in a good position here. And for the first time in this match, Katz wins a frame that he actually deserved to win. Right, 3-1. So 3-1 to Katz, but like we said before, this could so easily be 3-1 the other way around. Ranty's played exceptionally well today, not really put a foot wrong. Don't count him out. Difficult to know what to do here. Katz has that red over that middle bag. But if Ranty can force a snooker with the way he's playing, you put him uh, odds on favourite to clear up. Here's the snooker. And that is the first bad shot Ranty has played today. Can Katz follow it up with an even worse shot? Possibly. After some great positional shots today, Katz goes and does that. What a wanker. It wasn't It's black for the match though. He doesn't deserve it. He absolutely does not deserve it. But he'll take it. So the scoreline there, not doing Ranty any justice whatsoever. It could have easily been 4-1 the other way. But we're at a stage now where both players have started to loosen their arm a bit and are beginning to look a little bit like their old selves. Yeah, to be fair, he was a bit unlucky, but we did hang around and we did play a little bit more pool, some of which you'll see while you hear uh, the interview, including some speed rounds in which we challenged each other to see who could clear all the balls on their own as fast as possible. But for now, here is the interview. We start off with some silly icebreaker questions and then it's down to the serious stuff. Question number one, socks or hamsters? Hamsters. Question number two, yes or no? <laughs> yes. Question number three, grapes or raisins? Uh, great. Controversial. Question number four, Idris Elba or Kermit the Frog? Oh, Kermit the Frog. Yes. Uh, question number five, five pound or ten pound? Ten pound. 
Question number six. Would you rather have three nipples or an extra thumb? An extra thumb. Okay. Question number seven. Would you rather have three nipples or an extra thumb if the extra thumb had to be on your forehead? <laughs> no, give me the nipple. <laughs> Which would have to be on your forehead? Um, um, I, I would um, sue the doctor, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, question eight. Uh, skid marks or Coronation Street? Oh, uh, 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 skid marks. Skid marks, okay. Yeah. M money or time? Time. And question ten. Yellow snow or brown toilet roll? Yellow snow. Okay, Ranty, I can tell you you got four out of ten correct. Okay. Well done. That's fine. <laughs> was, there a, a, was there obviously some kind of... The criteria was obvious. If, if you need uh, that explaining to you, uh, I can't help you. Um... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm not... I'm not going to ask you how you got into Flat Earth because I know that you've covered that in the videos and we had a chat about it when we were over at the Velvet Trail car park. Um, but what I do want to ask you is once you once you were in Flat Earth and once you like were fully committed, how did it how did it make you feel? You know, excited or scared or worried about the whole thing? What? Yeah, I'd say it was exciting more than anything because you had this the internet and I I hadn't had a lot of internet experience uh, to be fair until I actually found YouTube, so YouTube was mainly where I found the internet. And then you just, you have this idea that you can you can go out and you can experiment, you can change things, and a lot of things that they were said, simple things like you see too far, well you do see too far. I mean that's, it's, but it's just part of the globe model that's explained away with refraction, but from somebody that didn't have a scientific background, to, to then have this idea in your head that you're being lied to and that you know you can just go down with your camera and, and see stuff and you were seeing stuff you actually felt like you were you felt like you were achieving things that you were exploring things there wasn't many people doing it and you were the first per people out there with the cameras and doing all this kind of thing it was for me it was an exciting time um, because I felt like I was actually doing some good um, obviously <laughs> yeah <laughs> time wasted <laughs> but uh, you know I can get why you might think it's exciting because uh, suddenly everything that we know or think we think we know isn't real and then you you know there's so much more to go and discover etc but I think what I was trying to touch on with that was the and I, you said it yourself if everybody's lying to us there must be there must be an orchestration behind it um, and did you ever did it ever prey on your mind like who these people were that were doing the orchestration well I think if you ask every flat earther out there they'll have all gone down a trail to end up on flat earth you don't just end up as a flat earther it's not like you're an average everyday person you see a video the next thing you're a flat earther it just doesn't work that way you have to have like followed the breadcrumbs and the breadcrumbs um, are like little gateways into another conspiracy so the first conspiracy that most people find you know that brought them into flat earth or started their investigations off was 9-11. So then after 9-11, it's the next conspiracy, the next conspiracy, the next conspiracy. And they all seem plausible. They all seem uh, like they've got something um, that's truthful about them. And behind all of this, they all have that one narrative that there's a organization behind it all, uh, manipulating everything, changing people's day-to-day uh, -day, uh, beliefs by how they uh, do the laws and, and how they what they put on the TV, so sort of behind all of that, and you know this big organisation that's controlling everything and got the fingers everywhere is the ones that are causing all these conspiracies, and you you end up so you're already in the mindset then of what a conspiracy is, who's behind it, and then as these conspiracies get more and more outlandish, you're then more able to appreciate that it might be true because you've you've been desensitized to it bit by bit by bit so it's, it's like chipped away at your um, what any kind of sense that you had to start with <laughs> has been ch chipped away at to the point where you then are faced with a flat earth video Eric Dubay 200 proof, proofs or whatever and that suddenly you know you're like yeah yeah this is what they've been hiding all along you know I mean this is it so you arrive at flat earth kind of with already having that idea of this controlling group put yes. into place by other things that you've Fold. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So if we move away from the group then that are controlling it and um, covering it up and hiding, etc. If you if you take 
the typical sort of flat earth argument they will say things like you can't have the vacuum of space next to um, next to the atmosphere right implying that there must be some kind of physical containment yeah. um, now I, I don't know whether that was ever one of your beliefs or not but a lot of the flat earth arguments seem to suggest that somebody must have come and built something that we then live on because a dome doesn't just you know a glass dome or container or whatever isn't just going to naturally appear there yeah so <clears throat> Did you ever think that? And if so, did you ever wonder who the crate might be? Did you have any ideas? Did other flat earthers trying to convince you one way or the other? Was it aliens? Was it a god? Or? Uh, lots of lots of questions there. But I think I think the main consensus is that in flat Earth, you know, to be a uh, true flat earther, you know, I only mean I meant that in the truest sense. Is like if you believe in the firmament and stuff like this, you have to believe in the the literal list of the Bible. You know, and how you know every every word spoken in the Bible is you know truthful. It's the word of God, and by doing so, then you end up as a you know as a firmament believer, etc., etc. And then that is all tied into the Christianity religion. So, in idea, you know, so who created the firmament? Who created the flat plane? In that respect, it would absolutely be God. You know, um, however you decide to, to call him that. And in different religions, there's lots of different names for God. You know, there's Allah and all that kind of stuff. And they all, you know, for the most part at least, is teaching that say that the earth is flat. So what you tend to do is you find that the, the religious sect fall into flat earth. And when they fall into flat earth, you will never separate the two. Yeah. Because they are, it, flat earth is interlinked with their religion then. And it becomes part of who they are, and part of their belief system. So I don't think you're ever going to change them. For me, I wasn't religious per se. Although I would say that if you asked me, you know, if you know who created stuff, I'd say a creator. But I'm not going to pray to somebody. I'm not going to um, do anything like that. But I will appreciate that there must have been a creator to create it. And was I a firmament believer? Uh, I didn't really talk about that too much because I actually thought there might have been land further afield. So if that's the case, and the firmament idea is that it incorporates all the known land, right? Mm. With the with the dome going over the known land. Well, in my idea of how I assume, because I believed in UFOs and stuff like that, I just believed they came from further afield. And in order for that to happen, the ice wall wouldn't have to have been the edge you know there would have been land beyond that so if the firmament was covering up up to the ice wall then it wouldn't have been extending it further afield so in my how I was trying to envisage it, envisage it was I was trying to incorporate well I've not really spoken about this actually but I was trying to incorporate the idea that you could have um, space with a gravitational effect and that it was flat but it was much bigger than what we knew and I wasn't saying there was definitely a firmament, but I was always kind of like in between what science was saying and what flat earthers were saying. So I was always trying to bridge that gap between what would make more logical sense mm. to me. Uh, because you, you see UFOs, you can't deny their existence. And if you do, where did they come from? You know, and for me, it was just simple. If they came from further afield. That's how I would have said it. Um, all right. So, again, you've said before plenty of times that you focused everything on uh, doing observations and, the, and like the optical side, the behaviour of light, etc. Why? Um, I know you, you, you've always been kind of like adamant with that. But obviously, in the whole kind of debate scene, if you like, people would bring arguments about radio wave propagation, seismology, you know, how GPS works, gravity, etc. Um, who were the people... Because I know you've said to me before that, you know, you just kind of assumed that the other flat earthers had that handled. Like, who, who were the people that you thought really knew the stuff in those areas? Um, well, I actually thought people like, um, like Quantum Eraser and Nathan were actually doing research. I didn't realise. Back then, you see, it was more of a case of, if somebody says that they're looking into stuff and they're actually researching it, I didn't not trust them hmm. to not be doing that. For me, I was... And this is why I've talked about my journey about my uh, OCD and my OCD with stuff. I'm very particular about completing something before I move on to something else. And, you know, I always like to expressly go over stuff until I'm 100% sure that I'm right. And that's why I stuck with optics completely. And I didn't want to dilute my knowledge on that by thinking about other stuff. So I was reliant on these guys for uh, coming up with ideas like 
you can't have gas pressure next to a container, right? So I understood the argument. But then on the other side of the coin, I also understood the argument from the Globe Earthers, that what they were saying, and I could appreciate it, but it, it frustrated me that the flat earthers would uh, butcher the, um, the actual Globe argument to a point where they could butcher it enough that then it sounded ridiculous. And I thought, yeah. but, but that to me isn't what they're saying. You, you're manipulating it to make it fit your narrative. And I understood that, and I fell out with a load of people over that inside of Flat Earth. Always the same thing, that isn't their model. Like, I'll give you another one, uh, you know, sea level, you know, um, and using Google Earth. Well, quantum arrays with Nathan Oakley, they're always saying, well, here, uh, you know, in the UK, it's, it's uh, zero degrees elevation, and in America, it's zero degrees elevation, so it must be flat the whole way. And yeah. I'm like, but that isn't their model. Their model says it's from the centre of the Earth and it would give you the same elevation. I mean, do you not understand that? No, no, it's a flat Earth model. It's not, it's a globe Earth model. Honestly, I had the amount of arguments I had, but the, the way they do this, it, um, it convinces their audience. They say it enough times, they go over it enough yeah. times, and it's a, it's a way of brainwashing them to, to finally believe it. Because, as I said, how you end up as a flat Earther is because you've been conditioned and brainwashed that whole time. But once you're in flat Earth, they have to then reaffirm why it's a flat Earth, and they brainwash you with their knowledge, yeah. which isn't knowledge. And uh, so, yeah, did I trust them to do that? Of course I did. And I never once put any evidence out that I wasn't, you know, given the whole information about where I was, what my observer height was, what time of day it was, everything. If it had been the other way around, I know that flat earthers would have lied and kept things secret and not showed stuff. I was totally different. So I was like a renegade in that respect. But I thought that was the only way to advance things, by being truthful. And I think that's why I set my own channel up, was because I realised ultimately that I wasn't getting that from the flat earth debate team. They were being very... Um, uh, mini well, not mini just... They were being very... I'm trying to think, think of a word without... Just being, they were just not awkward bastards. <laughs> <laughs> no, not even that. They, they were just, they would just think of something, and then they would twist it so much yeah. that it it didn't sound like what it originally should sound like. It's like, how can you, how can you, you know, when you're trying to talk about um, the Coriolis effect, how can you badger the globe models of Coriolis so much? That you've badgered it, you've bastardised it into something that it isn't. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I, know. I agree with that they take take an argument and then they misrepresent the argument, make it sound as if it's saying something it's not. Yeah, and then laugh about how ridiculous it is. You know, like I know one mini example of that, and I know you never did this. Was a whole, you know, pour water on a football and make it stick on the football. You can't do it. Well, nobody's saying you can. You know, no. uh, they but, create a straw man. Yeah, to break it down. Yeah, yeah. So that's what they do with the model. And they do it all the time. And I watched Flat Earth Debates on... Well, I listened to it on Friday, I think it was, or Thursday. Oh, my... It was... It, listening to it now that I'm out of the Flat Earth, I can appreciate how stupid it was. You know, how much they badgered every... You know, every single thing that they they had talked about was completely wrong. Yeah. It wasn't just wrong. Everything was wrong about it. Yeah. And I finally started to see... I'm actually... I mean, even, you know, even till so like that Thursday or Friday just gone, I, I still didn't think... Well, I still thought I was out of the, the movement, but I wasn't fully appreciating just how ridiculous it sounded until I listened to it on this Thursday and Friday. And then it's like, as the months go by, I'm starting to be freed from the spell, and then I listened to it, and it was just like, holy shit, was I actually a member of the Flat Earth Debate Team? Was that what I was like? Was I behaving like that? Well, I don't think you were, no. <laughs> you know, I don't think I was, but I mean, how did I sit around those people behaving like that? I didn't get it. And I was thinking to myself, they're just lying about everything. You have you have touched on this a lot, but um, Flat Earth seems to revel on, on trying to debunk the globe rather than prove yes. Flat Earth. And as you've just said, they do that by building up the storm and knocking it down, etc. Um... So, I mean, you kind of answered the next question. I was going to say, was that your mindset? Did you see it differently? You did. Um, but are there any flat earthers out there that, that you thought did the opposite, that actually went out and tried to prove the earth was flat rather than knock down the globe? Um, see, I'm going to say probably Bob from Globebusters is the only person that I think has actually got using science to try and, to try and figure it out. 
and I think he's the closest actually to flipping because as daft as it sounds even though he is so adamant that we live on a flat earth he is using the tools that will tell him that we live on a globe mm. right so eventually it's going to come to the point where he's going to be thinking to himself oh yeah the 15 degree per hour drift and all that kind of stuff you know he's finally going to figure it out and he's finally going to re appreciate that actually if you want to believe in a creator he could have just created the globe as well yeah yeah could have made it however he wanted <laughs> you know you know it doesn't have to be just because it's you know it's in the bible you know it doesn't have to be that you can still be a christian without you know believing you know everything like that so so i would say he's probably the, the closest somebody else like travis from the plain truth he's more like i was trying to find um, answers in optics as to not to counter the globe but to to basically say this is possible on a flat plane or this is how I would interpret it on a flat plane so I think that's the only ones I can think of um, I, I, I don't think the rest are into the rest aren't into it for proving the flat earth they're in they're in it to create a stalemate yeah because if they can get a stalemate they can keep the argument going and they don't want to have to face a loss I, I'd agree with that I'd agree interesting what you said about um Bob Nadell like it'd be great if he just woke up one morning and, and, and thought after all these science experiments which keep failing and failing and failing to prove the flat earth and, and give the results that should be accepted on a globe it'd be great if he woke up one day and just thought maybe I've just misinterpreted the bible quote yeah. maybe I've just misinterpreted that yeah. you know still still believe in his God still believe in whatever but yeah, I've just misinterpreted that that'd be great and as time goes by I mean you know space travel all that kind of stuff you know science is evolving people just you know it becomes more ridiculous as weeks go by mm. and they are you know when you see people still arguing about it and trying to say that Richard Branson was in on it and all this and, and then the next thing oh Bezos was in on it because he's done space flights it's like so the whole world's in on it then, right yeah yeah no it's just a small group of people that are wrong and are just there's some con men out there Ella Nathan Oakley who are bastardising the globe argument so that they can try and get a whip. And he just sounds good because he can repeat things over and over and he's a good, he's a, he can articulate things well that, that kind of convince people and brainwash them. Yeah, and, and I think there are a few out there who are quite articulate and like say, if, um, if other people have their trust in them that they're doing the research you know it kind of takes the weight off their shoulders to have to think about it for themselves they've got this articulate guy who can give them all the answers and, and whatnot um, okay so another one oh, almost the last one you look at channels like mine Simon Downs MC Toons uh, there's loads of who can't debunking channels and obviously you own now as well okay but do you think that the channels that do what we do do more harm than good do you think if they just didn't exist uh, flat Earth would be less publicised and it would go away quicker. What no, do you think? No, I think if we didn't stand as a gateway to stop Flat Earth from spreading, it would spread. That's what I feel. Because the arguments are easy to fall into if you if you come across the right video at the right time or the right type of person. Um, I mean, I am gonna sort of like maybe we say that again in a different way which is like maybe because YouTube now have changed the algorithm so that they're not promoting conspiracies as much then it would be harder for people to just naturally fall into flat earth because they hadn't gone down the conspiracy mm. um, trail to end up on flat earth but that doesn't mean that you know there are people out there that aren't susceptible to that type of you know uh, rhetoric that Nathan puts out and stuff like that and also Bob. Bob. Bob sounds very authoritative when he's speaking uh, on the Globusters channel and he gets, what, 1,500 live viewers? So, you know, there's a there's a chance there for this still, still to spread if there wasn't people actively, for every video that a flat earther puts out, there's 10 debunking videos put out about it. And if that wasn't the case, then I do feel that, you know, people would start to fall back into it. You know, the, the, it would grow. I think we I think it is I, I absolutely <coughs> think that flat earth is shrinking now pretty sure of it a lot of people dropping off mm. um, but that's only because the amount of people that are doing the debunking they continue to put the videos out all the time and if that stopped 
and I don't think they're doing any harm by putting these videos out because the people that are punting the flat earth, including myself when I was doing it, and I appreciate this, that I actually probably affected a lot of people and, and probably caused a lot of problems in their own life, probably a lot of uh, relationship problems that probably were caused because I convinced them that the earth was flat. So, from based upon that, you know, I did a lot of harm, in my opinion. So if I if I can appreciate that I did a lot of harm, then they can appreciate. I can appreciate that they are still doing a lot of harm to the people that they still promote to. They are still keeping people trapped in the religion of, or the cult of flat earth. And you know, it's our well, it's my at least. I feel it's my responsibility to try and pull them back out of it. And uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Everybody I've spoken to who's been in flat earth and come out of it has said that it did their life no good whatsoever. Um, and you know, maybe there's some people out there that that it, that it does. But you know, one of the early questions I was asking about how do you feel, do you obsess about who did it all, etc. I, I get a feeling that it, it would take over your life. Yeah, it did, and it was it was kind of quick for me. And but the thing is, I could have slipped into it and slipped out very quickly. There was a window of opportunity for me to slip into it, do my research and slip back out of it. But unfortunately, Sleeping Warrior got a hold of me very early in my um, YouTube releasing videos about Flat Earth. He literally found me, and I would say stalk in a lot of ways, because he kept messaging me and getting him to come and do observations with him. Suddenly he was wanting to um, spend a lot of time talking about this and introducing to other people to talk about it. So, if I didn't have that in my original uh, early days, it, you know, I wouldn't have um, I wouldn't have stayed in Flat Earth. I would have gone down the beach, I'd have seen that I could see further, I'd have been quite happy that I could see further, I'd have been, eh, okay, you know, and I'd have just walked away. But then he brought me into it, and then, you know, then you've got a bit of a community building around you, and then, you know, then you spend more time doing Flat Earth stuff, and then you start seeing less of your friends. Mm. And then you spend more time at home, sitting at your computer, talking to other people, watching the next video that comes out, watching the next live stream. Then you're communicating people on Skype or arguing with them on YouTube. And before you know it, then you're spending all your time on YouTube and you, you're spending less time at work. Uh, you're not spending time with your family. You sit in your room more often, you're getting withdrawn. You're starting to get a little bit depressed because your real friends are just friends of yours that are online that you've never met before. And your real friends in the real world, you don't see them anymore because you've pushed them to one side. Yeah, so it is a shame. And I think that's that's ultimately what I I hope that um, you know our videos do at some point is, is stop people from going down. You know, by by showing it up to be as silly as it is and, and the arguments to you know to be as laughable as they are. Hopefully people on the fence might look and be like, oh my God, what was I thinking? But in terms of the people who were already flat earthers, do you think simply watching a video that I make or Simon down or you make it, do you think those people who are entrenched already, do you think that will ever do any good or do they need to find their own answers in their own life? I think, the, I think your videos will set a seed whether or not it grows or not. Um, I wouldn't like to I wouldn't think it would to be fair I think the only thing you're doing or what we're doing is stopping the fresh people from coming into Flat Earth and killing it off before people start joining on mass because it's one of those cults that you could join on mass because it's tied to religion and stuff mm. like this so people could flop in but if you're not there pumping the videos out saying to people look how ridiculous it is then you know, it could be an open floodgate for people to come in. Those that are already in it, they have to find their own way out. And unfortunately, you could have, they could have 10 solid proofs of theirs. And if you debunk nine of them completely, and they accept that you've debunked nine of them, but they're clinging on to just one still, they will still believe the Earth is flat, being adamant flat Earther, until you break down every single thing. Now for me, it, it was just one thing that I needed. I wasn't to, in, I wasn't, wrapped up in all the other arguments. I didn't care about them. The only thing I cared about was my location that showed mm. flatness, right? So when the observation that, you know, we were down before showing, um, when that was uh, out and about, I had to appreciate that we live on a globe. It was as simple as that. It was very, um, it was what I needed. You know, that was the only thing that would have proved it to me. Just looking at my location and understanding what we're looking at. 
I saw it as uh, it, it's definitely drop. So even though you know the two arguments that I had in my head, refraction or flatness. So that was the two arguments. That's why even the even the globe earthers at the time were saying, I can't believe how, how flat it looked around you. You know where you live because it did. So it was either it's refraction or it's a flat plane. So it was always 50-50 yeah. in that respect. And I needed a um, like a, a referee. And the referee was the image of Blackpool that Bev went and repeated. Great, thanks Bev. And um, that was the referee. And the referee told me that there's drop on those mountains in the background uh, in relation to Blackpool. So it had to be, you know, it had to be a refraction that I've seen rather than a flat plane. Mm. So... It was a, a stunning image, stunning image. It was nice to get back there and uh, see where it all started and ended. Well, listen, I'm going to thank you for your time and um, I'm going to wrap it up here. No worries. Well, thank you for everything you've, uh, you've done tonight. It's been a good day. It's been a good good. day. Thank you so much. Cheers. Right. Cheers, cats. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Now, if you follow me on Twitter, you might be wondering, where is your question that you uh, asked me to put to Ranty? Well, I did put all the Twitter questions to Ranty, and they're going to appear in another video. But for now, uh, I'm just going to sum up what I learned um, on my day with Ranty. Uh, first of all, I got a much better understanding, I think, of why he ended up believing what he did believe. I got a, and I might be misrepresenting him here, I'm sure he'll, he'll tell me if I am, but I got a sense that he was extremely frustrated about the time that he did spend in Flat Earth. Uh, I got the feeling that he thought, you know, that, that could have been time better spent doing other things. And, and maybe that's why he's now started his new channel where he's, he's trying to stop people going down the same rabbit hole um, he did. It'd be interesting. Uh, I just hope that because of the huge subscriber base that Ranty built up before he decided, you know, that he was wrong... I hope that some of those people will follow Ranty's lead and, and follow him out of Flat Earth. And to be fair, I do believe that that is already happening, but that's Ranty's story to tell, not mine. So good luck with that, Ranty. Um, for now, thank you for watching, and I'll see you again.